Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you glory and honor. We thank you for the awesome opportunity to come into your house, to take communion together, remembering the sacrifice of our Lord, to join the angels in heaven and sing the songs that they sing. They sing about your majesty. Lord. They see it. They know it. They're not confused. They know who the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is. Lord, help us, your people. As this world is changing before our eyes, oh Lord, and becomes more clear and obvious every day that goes by, something that's really, really bad, Lord God, but we as your people cry out to you. We call upon your holy name. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would speak through me and that you would use me as a vessel. Lord, that your word would go forth, Lord, with power and anointing, Lord God. And that it would transform our hearts and lives, oh Lord God. That it would give us clearer understanding about who we are in Christ and who Christ is in us and what this plan was all about. We give you glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So I wanted to kind of start off. So we're talking about water baptism this morning. And I decided to use Romans 6. And I'm kind of probably, I'm a preacher that probably would never typically do that. And I want to be careful that I don't over get too technical. Some of you people in here, we've been studying the Word of God. We've been studying the book of Romans together for years and years. And, 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 and you know, we've, we've really dug deep into the book of Romans. And, and it's really been transformational in many of our lives. And at the same time, I, I don't know how deep we're going to get, but we're going to utilize Romans chapter 6 as a water baptism text, even though in reality, I don't believe that it is directly a water baptism text. Okay, and so let's just go ahead and go through and let's read a little bit before we get going. It says here in verse 1, this is, the, I'm using the ESV version, is that what we are? ESV? Yes. Alright, awesome. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means, how can we who died to sin still live in it? I just want to break down for you just for a moment that the word sin there in the original language is a noun. And so what it's describing is the fact that we've been born in Adam with a sinful nature. That's why people have a desire to go towards sin because they were born sinners. Nowadays in the, in, the, in the church world we live in, people don't really like, they don't feel comfortable hearing about sin. But I have to tell you that this isn't a preacher preaching down at the, at the congregation and looking at you and calling you a bunch of sinners. What I'm trying to say is all of us born of Adam have been born into sin and have been born with a sinful nature. And if you were curious why you have sometimes a desire even, even as a believer to go towards things that are against God, I need you to understand that your sinful nature will not be completely eradicated until you see the Lord in glory. The Word of God says that we, we don't know exactly what we're going to be, but we do know this, that when we see Him, we will be as He is. Yes. We're going to have a glorified body, hallelujah, and this sinful nature that we receive from Adam will be eradicated, and on that day, we'll be able to give Him all the glory, all the honor, all the worship, that is due his name. But I got good news for you because even on this side of glory, the Holy Spirit's working in your heart and in your life. He's working in, can y'all see all that? He's working in your heart and in your life. And the more we allow him to work, the more he's getting done in us. Amen. So it says, shall we continue with this sinful nature, this relationship? And he says, God forbid. And he says, didn't you know he says, how, how, by no means, how can we who died to this relationship with the sinful nature still live in it? How, how is it possible that a born again believer can continue to live in a relationship with sin? And I'm telling you, it's not possible. Let me tell you why. Because if you as a born again believer, what that means is that the Holy Spirit now lives in your heart. We're going to get into that before it's over with. Once the Holy Spirit is living in your heart, you will never be able to live in the old way that you, you, you can't, you won't be able to continue to do it. I'm not saying that you, that you can't engage in sin. I'm not even saying that a, a, that a newborn, again, believer can't engage in seasons of sin. But you will never be the same. That's right. You will That's be right. miserable. Yes. And the Holy Spirit is merciful. And he will pursue you. And he will speak to you and he will rescue you. Yeah. Amen. He's gonna, he's gonna rescue you out. He's not gonna leave you. In your, in that side of, uh, rescue me. Yeah, but the 
part about uh, you set me free. You found me as I am. Oh, yeah. Your grace has found me. Your grace has found me just as I am. Yes. I want. I want you to know that he he finds us just as we are, Amen. and he takes us just as we are. Yes. Yes. You gotta understand something. He ain't gonna leave you the way you are. Right. He's not gonna leave you the way you are. That's not part of the deal. It's not part of the deal. No, true believers in Christ are going to go through a process where the Holy Spirit is going to change them. Yeah. Amen? Amen? And sometimes some of the ways it worked in my life was ways that I didn't expect it to happen. That's right. That's right. And let me tell you this. As soon as you got free from the things that you thought you were free from, <laughs> y'all know what I'm talking about that bad stuff that everybody talks about? Oh, look at them. They're still doing this. Look at them. They're still doing that. And once he starts knocking that stuff off of you, if you're not careful, the next thing you know, you'll be full of spiritual pride. Yeah. You'll be full of an unteachable, critical spirit. How do you know so much, preacher? Well, you know, like Brother Larson used to say, eat off your own buffet. <laughs> but, but what I will say is this. He knows how to humble a man. Yes. He knows how to humble his yes. people. Yes. Amen. Yes. And, and it's a good thing when our Father chastises us. I just want you to know it's a good thing. Because, see, he that endures the chastening of the Lord, he shall be a partaker of his holiness. Amen. All right. So, look, we died. We, how shall we who died to this sin? And then he says in verse 3, Do you not know that all of us that have been baptized into Christ Jesus, that we were baptized into his death, and we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Now, I want you, I want to say this, but I'm not going to get overly technical about it. The word baptism there, there's no water in the Greek text, and it's not distinctly talking about water baptism. The Greek word had different meanings than what our understanding is. But what I do want you to understand is that water baptism is this in a sense. But what really happened is the day when you got born again. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. But if you've been born again, you should know you've been born again. Yes, yes. And this is how I know that you ought to know. Because Sister Tim used to say it all the time. you got to know that you know that you know. How do you know when you've been born again? Because you're, not, you're never the same. How? Because the Holy Spirit moves into your heart. He makes your heart his home. And it changes everything. Yeah, the things that you were doing yesterday that you were happy about, you ought not be happy about doing it today. And that's how you know. It's not, listen, that's one of the ways that you know, that you know, that you know that you're a new creation in Christ Jesus is because if you are still struggling with a sin or falling short of the glory of God and we all are in a process of being changed from glory to glory and to his image, <laughs> that if that's happening, you ain't happy about it. That's right. That's right. And if you are happy about it and it's against his will, it's because you had not had it revealed to you yet. Mm. Because he's not happy. Right. Amen. Right. Amen. All right. And so, so what I wanted you to see, though, is that did you not know that those of us that were baptized into Christ, that we were baptized into his death? And I want to talk to you about that just, just real quick. And I want you to understand on the day that you got saved. And, and I don't know when that was, but the scripture is real clear. It says that when you believe with your heart. And again, we've been talking about this a lot because the Lord's really been putting it on my heart lately. It's so important that we understand that we know that we are truly converted in Christ. Yes. The reason I say that is because I fear that there are churches filled with people that think that they're okay, but they have not truly been converted. Yes. They might have prayed a prayer at one point in time. They might have got dumped in a tank at one point in time. But I, I fear for, for souls. As I cry out to God, I'm like, Lord, I know that there's people that, that think that they're okay because they think that they've confessed Jesus. But, but you know, sometimes people believe in their head intellectually, but not with their heart. And, 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 you know, the Bible says that the devils believe, but yet they tremble. They can't believe unto salvation. So when a person believes with their heart, when their inner man says, yes, that's true. You may not even know all the things that I'm going to talk about. You might not still know it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying by the time we walk out of here. But this is one thing you will know. 
that when you believe on Jesus Christ from your heart and you believe that God raised him from the dead because he was the payment for the penalty of sin and you call upon that name, amen, and you mean business with God, then you're going to know because the Holy Ghost is going to move into your heart and you will never be the same. And that's what it's describing as a baptism into death where you became one. Just as in the water, you become one with the water just as in Christ. See, before you ever went down in the water, because we need to understand this, water doesn't save us. The blood of Jesus saves us. There was a song that used to talk about plunged in the, the blood that was drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Amen. Every, all, all those sinners take that plunge. I don't know how the words go, but, but the point is, is that there's a cleansing through the blood of Jesus. This is the, this is what, and it's a transformation that takes place in the heart and lives of people. And, and that's what people have to understand. And that's what we have to understand as the body of Christ, that, that when people are truly converted to Christ, that a miracle happens in their heart. A miracle happens in their life. Amen. And when the Holy Spirit moves in, he, he starts, he's starting to do a work and yes. he's starting yes. to, to change some things. Yes. So he said, we were buried with him by baptism and the death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the father, we too would be able to walk in newness of life. That right there is telling you that you can't keep walking in your old life. Amen. Amen. And in verse five, for if we have been united with him in a death like his. We shall certain, certainly be united with him in a resurrection like it. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin or that old sinful nature, that first birth in Adam might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, we have, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. So, so there's a death and a burial that's connected to true belief in Christ. And there's a resurrection to new life that's connected to the new life of Christ. Amen. Amen. And, 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 you know, look, and, and one of the things that's so important, and I, and I really want to encourage you to true believers. Yeah. As true, if you're a true believer this morning, you have to find a way to put the word of God in your heart. Listen, I'm not preaching words, but I'm not going to overcorrect it either. You have to find a way at all costs to put the word of God in your heart. That's right. Because see, the word of God is going to reveal to you the difference between the world system That's right. and God's system. Yes. It's going to reveal to you the difference between the world's kingdom and and God's kingdom. Yes. And if you don't know what this book says and you get your stuff off social media, the next thing you know, you'll be so confused in your walk with God. You'll think that your life's okay because you're not as bad as the person sitting next to you. And I'm here to tell you right now that the person sitting next to you is not the plumb line of what righteousness is. Jesus, the son of the living God is the plumb line of what righteousness is. And we need to allow the Holy Spirit to move in our hearts and in our lives and to change us. Yeah, you look, this isn't in my notes, but I just got to tell you, and I've been saying it a lot because I can't get it out of my heart and my mind. The Lord has been revealing to me the severity of the reality that one day you and I are going to look him in the eyes. Now, that's a beautiful thing being washed in the blood of the lamb. Yeah. I don't want I want you to understand that there, that justification by faith says that that God has declared you innocent because of the righteousness of Jesus and the fact that he died for you. And when you put faith in that, the whole God, the God covered you in the righteousness of Jesus. And that's what's getting you in. But I'm here to tell you that there better be a healthy fear of God that collides with our justification and helps us to walk in reverence and awe of the holiness of God. Because we're walking around here acting like, oh, it's okay. I'm just snuggling my struggle. No, 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 no. One day we're going to stand before him. And I'm here to tell you, it's a severe thing. Because, because what we don't know is exactly what lies on the other side. And there's so much in the word that we take for granted. I, You're right. I'm in the right You're spot, right? right? Yeah. There's so much in the word. There's so much connected to the words of Jesus that we take for granted. And we've been preaching about that the last two to three weeks. And even the Lord said, you will be justified by your words. You will be condemned by your words. And I'm like, what are you talking about, Jesus? He said, you, 
the word of God says I was justified by faith. You know, the word of God is a mirror for your heart. Mm. And, and let me tell you, Christian, that I think that I'm a good pastor if I say these true, true words to you. The words that come out of your mouth reflect what's in your heart. That's right. Yeah. That's that's right. Right. Yeah, so Jesus is saying that if something's coming out of your heart that's contrary to my words, come on. Yes. You may not be what you thought you were. Yes. Right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? I mean, I think that this is really important because we're going to have a come to meet with Jesus one day. And no, it's real. It's not a science fiction show. It's real. Amen? And I want, but look, I'm just telling you right now, the Lord's like, son, you, you're you going to stand, I know, I keep saying that to y'all, I'm not going to say it again. You're going to give account for your words, boy, <laughs> son. Praise God. So we were born into sin and we have to die to sin. Baptism is the burial of the old man. When we baptize, we are having both a funeral for the old man and a new birth celebration for the new man. Amen. So whoever goes into the water next Sunday, whenever you, you're going in, what, what you're saying at that point in time is, God, I believe you sent your son to die for me. Your word says that by faith I die with him. I'm buried with him and I'm going to resurrect. I'm coming out a new man. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm here to tell you that it already happened if you believed it, but going into the water is your outward profession and your confession of it. And I'm telling you, I don't think that we've given water baptism this right dude. I'm telling you, Jesus said to be baptized. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Look, when we, look we gotta understand something. When we're going down, we're saying we're leaving the old life behind. I need you to know that. I need you to, listen, you might say to me, preacher, I don't know how to do that. That's okay. I can't answer every single question for you, but I know one who can. And if you'll hold his nail-scarred hand and you'll walk this journey holding on to him, he will teach you. He will lead you. He will guide you, my friend. But you got to be willing to understand, you're going to leave that old life behind, amen, and you're going to move forward with him. Hallelujah. The king. Thank you, Lord. All right. Let's go ahead and transition to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 uh, verses. And we're going to read verses 1 through 11. I'm just going to go ahead and read it. And then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go back and, and, and kind of talk about some. He says, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers... We're all under the cloud. Now he's talking about, he's talking to, I'm not trying to get overly technical. Paul is a Jew. He's talking to Gentiles, but he's explaining that his people's fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the fathers of the faith, and, and the children of Israel during the wilderness were under the cloud. Y'all remember the story when the children of Israel were in the yes. wilderness after they had gone through the Red Sea? We're going to talk about that a little bit more. There was a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. That, was the, that represented the presence of God. The presence of God was with them, the, right? He was leading and guiding yes. them. And so the Apostle Paul is using, this is a new tendency. We, when we have different people at different levels of their understanding of the Bible. When we're reading out of Corinthians, we're reading a New Testament letter that was written by the Apostle Paul. Okay, but he's referring to something that happened in the Old Testament. And he's saying, I don't want you to be unaware, brothers, but our fathers were all under the cloud. They all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. Now. I was talking to somebody yesterday at one of the clinics, and I'm having a car. He's like, just can't believe it. Can't believe the, that, that book that was written by men. And that's the word out on the street. Yes, yes. I'm here to tell you that I have no problem whatsoever. If the Bible tells me that there was a rock, which was Christ, that followed them in the wilderness and fed them a living spring of water, I believe what the Word of God amen. says. If the Bible says that manna fell from heaven and fed them, amen, while they were in the wilderness, I believe that God caused manna to fall from heaven and feed them in the wilderness. I believe that if God says you better collect enough on the sixth day so you can eat on the seventh day, because if you don't, then your manna's going to turn into worms. Because if, if you try to go collect it on the seventh day or you try to collect extra, your stuff's going to turn into worms. That's right. 
I believe that. Amen. I don't have any problem whatsoever believing that. But you know what? Part of the reason why I don't have a problem believing it? Because I've been born again. That's By the grace of God, I've been That's born it. again. Yes. And the Holy Spirit lives in my heart. And people that haven't been born again, they have a hard time believing the word of God because the word of God's not in them. And you and I can't pick and choose which parts of the Bible we're going to believe. Right. And it wasn't written by men. The Bible's own testimony of itself is that it's Theo, God, Neustos, breathed. It's God breathed. It was breathed in man through man and it was given to man so that man would understand his heart, his nature, his character. I mean, this guy knew a lot of information. I don't mean to get off on him, but he was smart. He's like, man, we know now that there's a multiverse and there were giants in the world and Jesus and chapters. And I mean, he's going on. And I'm like, dude, everything that you just said coincides with the word of God. And I mean, the conclusion that you have to come to is either number one, the word of God is being fulfilled before our very eyes. Or number two, there's some very powerful, rich people that are trying to make it look like it. Exactly. I'm like, okay, if that's your position. <laughs> I'm just saying, no, it becomes very obvious to me that it's unfolding before our eyes. Amen. Anyway. Thank you, Lord. They were over. Nevertheless, verse five, some of them, God was not pleased with some of them for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Verse six. Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink. And rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did. And were destroyed by serpents. Nor grumble if some of them did. And were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example. But they were written down for our instruction. On whom the end of the ages has come. Now, I want to kind of, listen. I, this is probably a different kind of passage to preach water baptism out of, but I, but I, that's why I put I have some stuff to put on this screen for you right here. Okay, so here we go. Here is here's my little graphic for Israel. All right, y'all know the story. Clouds. <laughs> <Amen. laughs> Hopefully that didn't do what it did. How you did that? Really <laughs> All right. So here's the story. See, this is a graphic of the world right here. And I'm trying to tell you that Egypt is a type of the world. Egypt had a Pharaoh, a leader that had God's people in bondage. When you and I are born in our first birth, we're going to talk about it a little bit more in a moment. We were born in bondage to the world. We were born in bondage to the world system. We were born in bondage to sin. Now, I didn't put the graphic in here, but we, most of us talk about this a lot in this church. That just as Israel was saved, we were saved. How does that, what are you talking about? Israel was saved and brought out of Egypt. How? Through the blood of a lamb. You remember that? Uh, the first Passover lamb. They took the blood and they painted the doorpost and the side post. And it was the death of the righteous lamb that allowed God's judgment to pass over his people and instead to be poured out on the world. I have to tell you that judgment is coming. Yes. Judgment is coming upon this world. But I got good news for you, my friends, because the fulfillment of the Passover lamb is Jesus. Jesus was crucified on Passover, amen. And if you are a true believer this morning, then in the spirit, your heart has been painted with the blood of Jesus, amen. And judgment has already been placed upon Jesus. I'll tell you one thing, look, I'm not, look, my, my friend back there, he, 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 we were having a Bible study the other night, some good stuff been coming out of the Bible study. And he said, man, I think I'm gonna use that. And then and, 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 and texted me a couple of days later, and he said, I used it today. And I said, oh, yeah, text me again what you, what you said. And then, and then I used it the next day. <laughs> and I don't know if I said it exactly like he said it. But, but basically, he told his friend at work, he said, he said, man, look, I just got to be honest with you. I consider you my friend. I need you to understand we're all on a journey. We're on a journey towards judgment. And he said, one day you're going to see the judge. And, and he said, you got to find out what did you, 
What did you do with the fact that he poured his wrath out on his son? He poured his judgment and his wrath out on his son. I know that's not exactly how you said it, but it was something like that. What, what have you done with that? And that is the question that every human being must ask themselves. If we really believe this book that, we're, that, we're, that we read, if we really believe this book and what it says, and, and many people are like, oh, that's, that's me to say that. How can, that's not the love of, what are you talking about? That's not the love of God. That's absolutely the love of God. If you obviously believe what the word of God says and that, that people have not allowed the judgment that belonged to them to be placed on Jesus through faith and that one day they're going to face the judge and that the wrath of God will be poured out on them because God the Father so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and that he was willing to pour his wrath and his anger about sin on his son Jesus and we refused it and rejected it? That's a serious, serious thing. And I know that that's not for y'all in here. Amen. Y'all receive Christ. But all right. So that's what the Passover lamb was all about. And that's what Jesus, Jesus actually, Paul said, he is our Passover. He's the fulfillment of the Passover lamb. Amen. And, and it says that Israel, which was the nation of Israel, we're not going to go all the way backwards, but they were in Egypt. And it says our fathers were under the cloud. And, and, and so here's my little, here's my little graphic that they, that not only were they under the cloud, the scripture says they passed through the cloud. They were, they passed through the cloud. They were baptized into the cloud. They were baptized into the sea. They were baptized into the water. Now, if you remember the story, the Lord had them paint the side post and the door post, but then, but then they went through and what? They were stuck at the Red Sea. You remember that? And, and the Lord told Moses to raise the rod. And when he did, the, the Red Sea split open and the children of Israel began to walk through. Amen. And the, and the scripture talks about the fact that the water was like walls. And that's another thing people can't believe. But if, like, if you wait, wait around long enough, archaeology's already started finding that's stuff, right. but you ain't want to talk right. about it. But, but look, can you imagine that? I think about this. I think they were stuck between two rocks and it was literally a rock in a hard spot. And the sea was before them and they could hear Pharaoh's army coming. You think that the ground wasn't rumbling? I'm just trying to say sometimes the things of the world are so loud and they're rattling us and everything's rumbling and all the chaos and all the confusion and fighting with family and fighting with friends and, you know, drama at work and all this other stuff. And it's getting so loud and, and that we can't even that we can't hear the voice of God anymore. But they, I'm telling you right now, they can hear Pharaoh's army coming and the Lord said, lift up that rod. And when that sea split, hallelujah, he made a way. And that's what he does. He's a way maker. Amen. And he made a way where there was no way. And, and Israel is, is going through that Red Sea. And look, the Bible says that Pharaoh's army was following behind them. And I was thinking, I don't know, I saw a movie one time where there, it was like walls of water. And I'm just thinking, you know, how loud was it? How loud was it for them to be almost like in that tunnel and going through and they could hear the, their chariot wheels rolling and the whips hitting the, hitting, yeah, yeah, and all this clanking and metal. And then all of a sudden, I don't know how long it took for the waves to subside. But then all of a sudden it was quiet. All of a sudden it was quiet and it was calm and they were on the other side. They were on the other side of the, the place where God had promised them that they would be. And part of the text that we're reading from, though, tells us that the problem with them and the reason God wants to use them as examples is that they started doing something. They started looking backwards. They were over here now. The place where God had wanted them, they had gone through here. There was a barrier that separated them, and this was their old life, but they started looking backwards. They started looking backwards at things from their past. And many times believers, as believers, we do the same. Right. We're looking back at our old life. We're looking back at the things of the past. Yes. We're yearning and desiring yes. things, and they didn't do anything but cause us trouble. That's right. right. And they're against the will of God. And, and the scripture's clear. It's like, so what I need you to understand about baptism is, is that when we're going into water, I didn't say you had to be, we are, we're perfect in Christ. Yes. 
But what I'm trying to, I need people to understand that when we go down in the water, what we're saying is, Lord, I'm leaving Pharaoh. I'm leaving his army behind. I'm leaving Egypt behind. I'm leaving the garlic and the leeks and the melons. I'm leaving all that stuff behind. Because how, how does that old song go? Uh, uh, I have decided, huh? Yeah. Uh, come on, somebody got to sing that. Who's going to sing that? Danielle, is high here. Yeah. Danielle, you're going to sing where you at, Danielle? I have decided there we go. to follow Jesus. Yeah. I've decided come on, young. to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. No turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning, no turning back, no turning back. Hallelujah, you know what? That's a song for a true, for the heart of a true believer right there. Yeah, yeah. Come on. Oh, but Taylor Swift got a concert in New Orleans and Nola this weekend. We got to go see Taylor again. All my friends are going. Oh, they got a party down the road. No, 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 no. The world yeah. behind yeah. me. Yeah. The cross before me. I like Pickle that Taylor Swift. I love it because she's a witch. Yeah. She's right. singing black magic to people, my friend. Yes, that's right. That's right. No. Uh -oh. Yeah, I know. It wasn't good enough. I couldn't help myself. The world behind me. The cross before. The cross is an instrument of death. Yes. There's a whole lot of stuff that was left over from this place over here that needs to die on that side. Yes. The cross is an ongoing work. Yes, yes. So good. I said something to some somewhere the other day where I was like, Lord, I can see the Lord as a surgeon. Scalpel? Yes, sir. <laughs> bellows? <laughs> I said that Wednesday, right? What's a bellow? It's like that thing that we used to, that mama bought when we were in Singapore. It stoked the flame. The, the Lord says, Bellows? Yes, sir. <laughs> Heating up the flame. Heating up the flame, the refiner's fire, we're gonna get the dross and the impurities out of the heart. Scalpel? Yes, sir. Okay, I gotta circumcise this heart right here. I gotta cut away this flesh. Put the cross on this. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So, so you get the point there, right? And so a similar concept with you. You the first time you were born. You were born in Adam. You were born in the world. And we talked about that earlier, the fact that we were born with a sinful nature. But good news, good news. God made a way to get you and I to cross over to the other side. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I thought that that was supposed to go. Oh, there we go. Okay, here we go. Bam! In Christ. See, when you that's what the Bible teaches, though. When you put your faith in yes. Christ and yes. conversion took place, the old man that you were that was born in Adam and born in sin was now transferred into Christ and that you now, according to God's will and his word, are a new creation. Yes. Yes. I was talking to somebody else at the clinic the other day. And we were talking about, we were talking about AA. I said, well, the no problem I got with it. And I had to go through the whole thing. So I'm like, I'm not fussing about it. I'm not trying to. Take nobody out if that's where you are. But what I'm trying to say is this. I got a problem with AA. And I'm going to tell you the problem I got with AA. Every time I had to go to one of the meetings, they said, you got to you introduce yourself. And I got to say, my name is Matt and I am blah, blah. That's not what the Word of God said. <laughs> the Word of God said, my name is Matt and I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. And this is the mountain we're dying on. Yes. Dying in Christ, but also whenever this world that we are in, we're in the world, but we're not of the world, as it continues to change around us, no, it's worth dying on that mountain. 
Help us, Lord. So here's some of these verses right here in verse 3 of the Corinthian passage. If you could go to that, 1 Corinthians. It says they all ate the same spiritual food. They all drank the same spiritual drink. And look, boom, who was that? It was Jesus. Yes. Now, is that not amazing that God keeps writing the story over and again so that we could see it? His provision, his dream. He said, you know, he said, listen, any man that believes in me, living waters. <laughs> Living waters will spring out of him, will flow out of him. Hallelujah. That's what happened with the rock. Oh, look, we don't even have time to really preach it like it should be preached. But the first time the Lord told Moses, he said, look, I'm going to go stand on that rock over there and I want you to strike it with a stick. Mm. It, it, God allowed Moses to strike him. He said it. That's what he said. I'm going to stand on the rock and I want you to strike it with a stick. And then the water is going to flow out. Now, that's not a type of Jesus receiving the strike of the stick of the cross in pre in advance, 1,450 years before Jesus ever showed up. Then I don't know what it is. But guess what? You don't have to keep crucifying him every Sunday, my friend. The next time you told Moses, now you got to speak to the rock. You and I need to learn how to believe in the finished work of the Lord, to trust in it, to believe it. And guess what? We need to allow the truth that's in our spirit to flow into our heart for it to be the abundance that speaks yes. out of our mouth. I believe that. Yes. God is alive. Hallelujah. I you know it because he's in me. Yes. He's in me. I believe that. He's a, he changes everything. I know you believe it. I can see it in your eyes. You might not be feeling it. You might not feel like you're walking in it, but I know you believe it. Yes, yes. And you know what you need to do? You need to tell your mind to line up with your spirit. Yes. You need to tell your own will to line up with your spirit. You need to tell your own emotions to line up with your spirit. Right. No, you lying to me, mind. That's right. your soul. That's why it says you must be renewed. Your, your mind must be renewed. Right. That's right. Our mind has to start lining up with what he says. Oh, but I've been trying. Well, okay. I mean, as long as you've really been trying <coughs> and putting the word in you, not the world. Amen. It's a big difference. Word. One L. <laughs> All right. Let me keep going. <laughs> Verse five. It says they were overthrown in the wilderness. You know, Joshua and Caleb had the only good report. Y'all remember that? Sent the spies into the land. There's giants in the land. We look like grasshoppers to them. They had, look, the grapes were so big and, and we just couldn't take them. And, and it said the Lord was displeased with them. So listen to me. I, I want to say something to you. We've all been in spots in our Christian walk. Every last one of us, starting with the preacher, have been in spots in our Christian walk where we, where we, we felt like we've let the Lord down. Where we felt like the struggle was bigger than our faith. Okay, and, and, and we've even thought, like, how am I going to get free from this? Yeah. But I'm here to tell you right now, the Lord has killed your giants. Yes. No, it's already done. Hallelujah. He's already killed the giants. And now it's time for us to rise up like Caleb and Joshua yes. and to believe and to give a report and to continue to believe and to continue to trust yes. and to right. believe and continue yeah. to trust and to hold on. Hold on to him. Hold on to him. Yes. Amen. Yes. Continue to believe. Don't believe what the world around us is saying. Don't believe what, what the people close us to us are saying, no, 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 no. We're going to believe in the report of the Lord. Amen. Whose report will you believe? We will believe the report of the Lord. Amen. Amen. <laughs> yeah. What does his report say? His report says, I am healed. His report says, I am filled. His report says, I am free. His report says, victory. Oh, make me want to start <laughs> Thank you, Lord. This is unorthodox. Yep. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. All right. Jesus. Look at this. It says in the scripture we read in verse 7 of the first Corinthians passage, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. He was talking about whenever Moses was up on the mountain. He said, you need to go down there and take care of the people. Because they done, and y'all remember that story? I mean, listen, I didn't mean to spend too much time on it, but in that story, Moses comes down there and is like, what are you doing? The people just threw their earrings into the fire, and then this golden calf came out. 
But, but what I want you to see here is this. What's really happening here is, is that they've crossed over the Red Sea. They moved into a new land. And in the land of Canaan, the people worship the calves. The people worship these bulls. And so they're already starting to assimilate and create for themselves new gods. The point that I'm trying to make is this, is that we as new, we as believers in Christ cannot let the world around us convince us that it's okay to believe what they believe, to do what they do, yep. and, and, and to worship what they worship. Amen. Amen. That's the point that I'm trying to make. And, 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 true, and we got we to gotta know whether or not we want to truly be followers of Christ. Amen. Now, don't get me wrong now. The Lord's the one that cleans us up. He's the one that changes us. Amen. He's the one that does the work. We just have to let him do it. Amen. Amen. It says we must not indulge in sexual immorality. This is another example because what he's talking about is in Numbers 25, whenever the children of Israel went to the sacrifices and connected themselves to Moabite women. So that's a long story in itself, but this is the easy version of that. Y'all ready for the easy version? Here's the easy version. They allowed themselves to engage in relationships with differing beliefs than what they had. They connected themselves in relationship with people that had different beliefs than what they had. Yes, yes. And the very thing that God warned them through the ages would happen, happened. The women that they allowed themselves to be connected to drew their hearts yes. away from God. And the next thing you know, they're worshiping, they're committing sexual immorality with these women. And they're, and they're worshiping the false gods of these Moabite believers. Look at what it says in 2 Corinthians 6 and 14. It says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What does this have to do with baptism? I'm going to tell you what it has to do with baptism because the cross before me, the world behind me. Come on. And, and the baptism is describing the old life is the past and that I'm moving forward with the Lord. Yes. And that the word of God is, is my new world. The word of God is my new kingdom that I live in. The word of God is, is, is how I am to approach the Lord. Amen? Amen. He said we must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. What the scripture is saying is that this, what the scripture is saying right here is that they actually started to grumble. There was more than one time they started to murmur and complain. Now we've all been there. Come on church, help me out. We've all been there where we've murmured and complained. Yep. Oh, Lord, here's this preacher. <laughs> here's this preacher saying he's saying the same thing, you know, or, or you know, I don't know, this job or this woman you gave me, Lord, or this man you gave me, Lord, right? Grumbling and complaining or this house I'm living in. By now, I ought to be living in a five bedroom with crown mold and I don't know. Always grumbling about something, never happy. Never, never thankful. Come on, somebody, help me out. Help me out. I'm preaching better than your amen. And never thankful for what we have. For what he's done for us. A heart of gratitude and thankfulness. That we're not where we used to be. Recognizing his hand of blessing upon our life. Amen. And, 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 and look, at, look at this verse down here at the bottom. It says, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water. Well, that's not what the word of God said. It said he gave them manna from heaven and there was a rock that gave them water. There's no food, no water. Look at this. And we loathe this worthless food. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Yes, yes. Man, I'm telling you right now, when I read that, that broke my heart. That, that broke my heart for God. That broke my heart for me. At times in my own walk with God, yes. we we loathe this worthless worthless food. Yeah. What is this worthless food he's talking about? The New Testament tells us it was Jesus. Yes. Jesus yes. said, "I was that food. I was that bread from heaven." My father says right. that was a type of that bread from heaven. Yes. And and many times we don't like the place where God has placed us. Come on. Yes. We 
we don't like the position where we are and we're trying to like manufacture something, right? I'm about to get myself out of this thing. You might want to slow down and think about that. You might want to slow down and wait on the Lord and let him lead. Let him lead. I'm not trying to endorse no singers, but hey, you know, gee, I heard somebody say the other day, no, you know what? And I have this, in, not this, but I have something about him being Lord in my notes that I heard a preacher say the other day. No, you know what the Lord means? It means, okay, you stop the car. Jesus gets out the passenger side. He get, comes around to the other side. He sits down and you let him drive. No, 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 no. Better than that. Why don't you go ahead and get up? Get out of the car. Come around to the back. Let me unlock this trunk. You sit up. You get laid up in this trunk. I'm going to close this trunk. I'm going to drive this car, and, and I'll let you know every now and then of what we're going to do. That might really bother some people. Come but on. the point is, is that we need to separate ourselves from the one that's making the decision. We don't need to know every turn he's going to take. We don't need to know the GPS coordinates before he gets us there. We need to learn how to believe by faith. And because of his goodness and his grace, if we will put ourselves in his presence and we will put ourselves in his word you know what he's going to do he's going to be gracious and merciful and he's going to speak to us and he's going to he's going to tell us in our heart what he's doing and then yes. and we just got to learn how to wait through yes. faith and, through faith and yes. patience that the children of god inherit the promise yes. 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 through faith and patience i'm starting to learn man. the lord has been trying to teach me this. you need to learn some patience you're not the fixer you think you're here to fix everything and everybody. No, 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 no. You're getting in my way. <laughs> but I'm not the only one. Come on. Help me out. Thank you, Lord. Uh, okay, so here we go. Look, I took a picture of my little tombstone over there. I did that this morning. <laughs> so in your first birth in Adam, you're born into the world. You're born into sin. And, you know, I always draw this on the board, but you're born crooked, right? The Bible says that this wicked and crooked generation and the word in the Greek there is scolios where we get the word scoliosis so we're all broken we're dead to God, the things of God amen but good news good news whenever we believed a transformation took place amen and there we go we're baptized hallelujah we die in Christ and our old man and that's what the water the water is representing it's like a grave we're going down into the grave we were born in our first birth in Adam into the world, but now we're, we're part of Christ. The scripture says through faith, we've been baptized into him and we've been buried with him through baptism. And even as he was raised into newness of life, so shall we. Amen. And so now we become, we become new creations in Christ Jesus. And now we're, we're, we're in him. And, and he is our righteousness. That's, that's so awesome, man. He's our righteousness. Yeah, Praise God. We're, we're, we're seated in him in heavenly places. So I want you to understand that I do believe that it's so healthy for a fear of God to collide with justification by faith. It's so important when I say a fear of God and reverence of his word. Yes. Right? But I do want you to understand his, his righteousness is a gift. Yes. It's a gift. You can't earn it. Come on. It's so good. The word of God says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And in the book of Romans chapter 5, I think it's five times the word, the word gift is used. And finally in verse 17, you hear what it is. It's the righteousness of Jesus. Jesus' righteousness was given to us as a gift. The father gave a gift. He gave his son. And Jesus gave us a gift. He gave us his righteousness. Because he died on the cross. Yes. And the great exchange took place. He took upon himself yours, yes. my sinfulness. And he clothed us in his righteousness. Yes. Don't try to earn don't try to earn righteousness with God. Just take the right heart posture. I'll yeah, take the right heart posture, Lord. On my knees. Amen. On my face. I lower myself to you. I thank you. Can you, you know what I'm saying? In your heart, can you lower? Can we lower ourselves to the Lord? Amen. Amen. It's a good thing to do, man. To lower ourselves to the Lord. I think that was the end on that. Yeah. All right. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Absolutely. We can get rid of this. 
Thank you, Lord. So now let's take a look real quick. I'm almost done. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Because we're talking about leaving the past behind and moving forward in Christ and not looking backwards and not going backwards. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? These are the kinds of words that I'm trying to <laughs> describe to you as my fellow friends and brothers and sisters in the Lord that have been gripping my heart that I can't shake. Because I look at these words and look what he says. Do not be deceived. Neither is there sexually immoral, and you can define that however you want, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality. Probably most of you don't have that problem in here. Nor thieves. That's a pretty broad definition. I mean, you can... Plug in there what you think fits under thievery. This is kind of like a weird thing to say, but ever since I was swimming a long time ago, I've had a problem with my ear. It's not as bad as it used to be. It's like a dermatitis kind of thing. So sometimes my ears itch. <laughs> and so both of the places I work, they have these Q-tips, you know? And so I'm using these Q-tips, and all of a sudden I had to tell Danielle, like, I need you to buy me two boxes of Q-tips, because I got to pay these clinics back these Q-tips. And so I told, I told both of the clinics, and you see some different colored Q-tips in there, you know, I just need you to know why they're in there, because, like, I started feeling like I can't, because you can't just take whatever you think you can take. You understand what I'm trying to get at? Yeah. And so you can define thievery however you want, but the reality of it is, is that God's watching the whole time. Amen. God is watching us. Amen. And he knows what's in our heart. And that's the kind of thing that I'm trying to talk to you about. Uh, I mean, look, I don't know if the Q-tip thing was a big deal. I mean, one of the bosses is like, come on, man. You did no, 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 I don't answer to you. I mean, I do. But what I'm saying is I answer to a higher. Yeah, and what I'm, what I'm trying to say is, is that... Is, is that, do you want to stand before him on that day and feel like, oh, but I was justified. Come on, Come on. I was justified. I was cleansed. I was okay. But in reality, we were living outside of the word of God. Yep. All I'm trying to say is I'm just trying to help you because I love you. Amen. But look what he goes on to say. Thieves, nor the greedy. Boy, that's another one right there. Greed and covetousness, man. I'm telling you, that's a scary thing. You know why? Because, see, a lot of times when people are on drugs, sometimes people know it. You can see it in their behavior, whatever, whatever. Uh, sometimes whenever people are, you know, they're drunk or whatever, or sometimes if they're full of anger, you can kind of see it. But sometimes things like greed and covetousness, it's a little bit harder to see because it slips under the radar because we call it American prosperity. And listen, I'm all about the capitalism and I'm all about America. I love America. And God is a God that prospers. But, dude, there's something weird that can happen where it goes from prosperity to covetousness. Yes. And the next thing you know, we're being driven by it. And I know what I'm talking about because it's happened to me. And, you know, it's happened to me where we start to put the blessings of God before the, the truth of God. And I'm not saying that anybody in here is having that problem. But I'm saying that this is one that will slide under the radar. And we better check our heart. Because, see, these things become gods in our lives. And they start to affect the way we act and they start to affect the things we do and the decisions that we make. Yeah. And sometimes the decisions that we make based off of these things are contrary to the will and the word of God. Right. Help us. Oh, Jesus. That baby's preached. <laughs> <laughs> and such were some of you, verse 11. Isn't that beautiful? Such were some of you, verse 11. Such were some of you. We used to be these things. But we're not these things anymore. Hallelujah. Amen. We've done cross through the Jordan. Hallelujah. We've crossed through to the other side. We're new creations in Christ. Amen. Such were such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. Amen. First yes. Corinthians 6 and 17. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. I wanted to kind of, I'm about to close with these verses of scripture right here. You become one with the Lord through faith in Christ. Amen. And then he says this, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you 
whom you have from God. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. That's what I'm closing with. I'm closing with the fact that you are not your own. That you were bought with a price. The price was the precious blood of a lamb that was foreordained before the foundation of the earth. Look, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. We've been talking about this verse a lot for different reasons, but I just wanted you to see it. It says, Lord, Lord, twice. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord. I wanted to give you a definition for the word Lord. He to whom a person or thing belongs, about which he has power of deciding. He is the master of the Lord. He has the right to decide for you. He has the right to decide for me. We are no longer our own. Amen. We belong to him. That's a, that's a journey right there. Hey, can, can I get an amen? amen. That's a journey right there. To, to, we, it's easy to quote, right? Did you know that you're not your own? You were bought with Christ. We can quote it. But boy, I'll tell you, the dying to get there, huh? Help us, Lord. Yeah, at least I know y'all with me. Amen. Look at 2 Peter. We're going to close with this. Singers, musicians, y'all can come forward if you would. It says, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. I'm going to read 13 and 14, then I'm going to skip down to 17 and 8. It says, but according to his promise, his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness flows. Isn't, isn't that good? Let's read that one. According to his promise. We are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Do, do y'all believe that this morning? I, and that's kind of a hard one to believe too, right? I mean, not hard to believe, but it's hard to see. To, it's hard to, to imagine the new, the new heaven and the new earth and the new life and eternal life that Jesus came to promise. He said that in John chapter 12. He said... He said, the words that I speak to you, they're not my words, they're the words of my Father. And I know the commandment of my Father, and His commandment is eternal life. Jesus came to give us eternal life. It's a really big deal. I, I'm seeing it clear. I know I keep saying it, but it's because I'm seeing it clear. It's a really, really, really big deal for you and I to have been offered the gift of eternal life. Yes. Amen. Yes. yes. Verse 14, therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Look at verses 17 and 18. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own soul. Don't be carried away with false teachings. Don't be carried away with lawless people. Don't be carried away and you would lose your own stability. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A lot of people want Him as a Savior. Right? Ain't nobody really that I know of. Although I will say to the old boy I talked to yesterday, he said, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. I'm like, mm. you're not, you're not fine because you're not there. But once you get there, you're there. They want him as savior because they don't want, they don't want the bad thing. I'm talking about the people that that are saying that they love the Lord. But they don't want to let him be Lord. They don't want to allow him to say the past is the past and I'm not going backwards. I gotta move forward because his word says in Christ I'm moving forward and I'm gonna bow before the Lord and I'm gonna let him do the surgery in me and change me. It comes out of 2 Corinthians 13, the last verse we've been talking about it a lot. Joint participation with the Holy Spirit. Letting the Holy Spirit transform us through the work that Jesus already did for us at the cross. Move Holy Spirit. Put the cross on this thing in my life. Kill the old man. Resurrect the new man. Have your way in me. Be my Lord. 
not just my Savior, but be my Lord. Can you stand to your feet with me?